Good afternoon, my name is Sven Biker. I'm a lecturer here at the Stanford Business School and I also run my own consulting firm, which is Silicon Valley Mobility. I had the pleasure to work together with Jim Sweeney's team from 2012 until 2014. When we were looking at electric mobility and uh, a lot actually mulling over the question, what is really happening here? And even more so, what's missing? And so I guess that's part of the reason why Jim invited me today to moderate this esteemed panel here with the question, electrification of transportation at scale, myth or reality? And um, I couldn't help but actually go back into my email and check when Jim asked me last time to moderate a very similar question. It was actually in 2012, six years ago. And back then the title was vehicle electrification who should care when and how much. And so I can't help but note that the subtitles were very, in a very subtle way, always pose a question like, really? And I guess that's what we want to be discussing here today <laughs> with, with our panel from, let's see, from your right to your left. We got Courtney Prudeau-Smith, who is Chief Deputy Director at the California Energy Commission. Thanks for coming, Courtney. Mm -hmm. We got uh, Monterey Gardner, who's a senior advanced technologies engineer at BMW. And we got John Bozell, president and chief executive at CalStart. And um, the way how we will run this panel is I, I wanted to basically frame the discussion with a few remarks, what I see uh, or what I'd like to answer if uh, Jim Sweeney asked me the question, is it myth or reality? And, and then each of our panelists we agreed to three slides. Uh, you can see how um, the number three gets interpreted a little bit, but I think we'll do a very good job actually to provide a few personal and, and uh, also professional remarks, obviously, and then dive into a discussion. So I prepared a few questions, and then we definitely want to make sure that you also have time to ask your questions, because um, we might not be able to answer wholly that question, myth or reality. So we might need to rely on you as our guests here today to get into that. Um, with this, um, wh what I prepared in, in answering, or at least framing the question, myth or reality, is, is the following. So numbers usually tell a good story, maybe not the whole story. What you see here on the left is basically the new vehicle market share of plug-in vehicles. So plug-in, obviously, that's battery electrics, but also plug-in hybrids. In dark blue, on the left, you see California. And then on light blue, you see the US as a nation. And yeah, we can wave our bare flag and say, great, we are ahead. If you really want to look at the percentages, you would see United States today is roughly where California was um, about six years ago, last time I moderated this panel. And, um, and still there's something like 2015 in there, which I found interesting. And I really was digging deeper into it because it was like, what if anyone asked me what happened in 2015 when basically those market shares were dropping? And we saw that gas prices got lower and also the model mix was shifting to other vehicles that consumers started to say, well, you know what, these crossovers, I really like them. And the whole efficiency, yeah, it's a topic, but I really want um, that car. So this is where we actually see how fragile the electrification field in general, but also how emotional the automotive purchase process in the end is. And uh, overall, we obviously see the numbers are going up. Are they high enough in order to fight climate change? I think this is what we will get in a great discussion today as well. Another piece where you can say, is it myth or reality? Obviously, the picture on the right. How many charging stations do we have? We are approaching on a national level the 50,000 mark. This is charging points, not changes or not stations in general. And just to put this into perspective, we have in the United States about 125,000 gas stations. Each of them, you all have been to a gas station, I guess, somewhere between four and 10 pumps or something like this. So this is what you need to multiply then, um, those numbers with in order to really make an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. So we might have about maybe 1 million gas pumps as opposed to about 50,000 
charging point. So that's just a perspective, but certainly the numbers are heading in the right direction. Should it be a hockey stick versus a linear uh, growth? I think that's also something that we will discuss further. That's what out there, but really what is coming down the road? And there's always a lot of discussion about the technology. How is the technology moving forward? And maybe start with a picture here on the right, which is actually, well, how much does a battery cost? And I'm assuming there are many experts here in the room who are very familiar with the number of costs per kilowatt hours which is basically what you see here on the right. Basically, how much do you pay per energy unit of a battery? Or in other words, how much does your battery cost? Numbers going down over the years, so that is certainly good. In dark blue, you, sell, you see the individual cell, and then the entire battery pack is in light blue. There's obviously a difference. What many people see as the magic number is $150 per kilowatt hour. And if you read the analyst reports, you might find that Tesla might already be at $100, $150 per kilowatt hours. Uh, maybe GM as well with the Leaf, uh, sorry, Nissan with the Leaf and GM with the Bolt. So th there's, there's a lot happening in there. And still, I want to note, it might not just be about solving an equation where you say, aha, now actually we break even on cost and everybody is going to buy an electric vehicle. There's certainly much, much more that goes into the purchasing decision. And I guess we will be discussing this um, today as well. On the left, however, you basically see how much more capacity is being installed in industry, like producing these batteries. And why we all like to talk about the Gigafactory just across the state line um, to Nevada, where um, Tesla has uh, their Gigafactory. If you want to look at uh, the numbers here, which is comparing in dark gray 2017 to 2020 in terms of really how many batteries can these companies crank out, you see staggering growth, uh, which obviously is a bet like these batteries being needed. But on the flip side, this will bring down the cost for, for batteries further. So I would say definitely pointing in a good direction here that uh, electric vehicles will really be cost competitive. Now at California, and this chart uh, might steal a little bit of thunder from Courtney, so therefore I will be quick, but I wanted to, to have this as my closing slide because Jim in his announcements for uh, the session today basically said, there's a lot happening in California with uh, Governor Brown at the beginning of the year basically saying California must go even further to accelerate the market for zero emission vehicles and therefore propose by 2030 we want to have 5 million zero emission vehicles in the state of California. To put this into perspective, we have about 35 million vehicles in California for, by the way, about 39 million people. It's quite a few vehicles for that number of people, but that's really a substantial number uh, if you have a seventh or every seventh vehicle uh, should be a zero emission vehicle in California. There's quite some budget committed to this about two and a half billion dollars. We might explore in our panel how far we will get with this. And pointing out earlier the charging stations, there's a lot happening that we want to get to a quarter million uh, vehicle charging stations, what it says here, and also on hydrogen, which I think some of our panelists will allude to as well. So that is just to frame the topic a little bit. Now let's, let's get to our uh, experts here. Um, again, we got Courtney. Monterey and John, who will tell us more from their respective backgrounds and also, I guess, a little bit of a personal insights, what they would say in order to answer the question, mass vehicle electrification, myth or reality. With this, Courtney, do you want to carry on? Great. Do you want to pull up my slides? Yes. Let Great. Me do that. All right. Thanks. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Courtney Smith. I'm the Chief Deputy Director at the California Energy Commission. Um, so the Energy Commission has what I would consider two main roles in the electric vehicle uh, space. The first one is that we are the lead public agency investing in public charging infrastructure and refueling infrastructure. Um, and in addition to that, we also are uh, the agency that does electricity forecasting for the state. So that way we know what we need in the future. And you can't do that without knowing what transportation electrification demand is going to look like. So we actually conduct the only California-specific forecast for electric vehicle transportation. Um, so what you see here, this is actually taken from an analysis we did last year. So the question of this panel is, at scale, myth or reality? 
Um, this forecast uh, is one that's demand-based. Uh, it also uh, takes into account a bunch of different factors, demographic information, economic information. Uh, we look at what we expect vehicles to look at or to look like in the future, so what the cost uh, is going to be, what the range we expect it to be. Um, and then most importantly, it's actually based on customer preference. So we do a really extensive survey of customers and ask them, ask them what they would buy. Um, and so based on this forecasting effort, um, you can see here that we think it's reasonable to assume that in 2030, uh, we expect around 3.5 million electric vehicles on California, ro California roads, and actually uh, as high as 4.2 million. So what this says is a, a few things. One, it says we're really confident that we're going to be reaching our 2025 20, uh, goal, which is 1.5 million vehicles, or excuse me, 2020 goal, which is 1.5 million vehicles. Um, the, the second thing that it, that it shows is that our, our goal for 5 million electric vehicles by 2030 is ambitious, um, but it's one that really impels us to do more. Um, if you wouldn't mind advancing this slide, that would be great. Uh, the state has done a lot already to try and make it very clear and send the signal that this is where we want to go. Uh, we've set extremely ambitious goals. Um, so Sven already alluded to the governor's recent announcement through executive order um, establishing not only vehicle goals, but also infrastructure goals. Uh, 250,000 charging stations in the state by 2025, and then 200 hydrogen fueling stations as well in that same time frame. Uh, and just a note on that, those um, those numbers are actually, they coincide with analysis that we've done. So I know uh, a lot of people ask, well, what kind of infrastructure, public infrastructure do we need here in the state? Um, and so our analysis suggests that these goals are, are in line with what we need to keep the market going. In addition to setting really ambitious goals, we've established regulations. So many of you may be familiar with the ZEV regulation um, administered by the California Air Resources Board. Uh, in simple terms, this sets requirements for manufacturers um, in California to uh, sell or to provide to California consumers a certain percentage of electric vehicles. And there's a credit system. It's a little more complicated. Um, in addition to that, we also offer uh, a ton of incentives the California uh, uh, Vehicle Rebate Program, CVRP, uh, offers uh, for the purchase or lease of a new electric vehicle in the state of California, a discount depending on uh, what kind of vehicle it is. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are also providing funding through cap and, that are funded through cap and trade auction proceeds for both vehicles as well as infrastructure. Um, and then lastly, the state is um, putting quite a bit to make sure that we have the public infrastructure that we need um, to make this transition so that way that is not the barrier for why people choose not to, to drive electric. Um, in fact, the governor recently, as part of his gov uh, budget proposal, um, has put forth $812 million towards infrastructure over the course of eight years. Um, so we'll see how this budget cycle plays out, um, but very much trying to double down on our, um, our investment in this space. Uh, and then lastly, we also um, do a lot of research, particularly around the interface between transportation and the grid. Switch? Great. Um, but we're not there yet, right? Um, and that's what this panel is about, is um, when is this, is this going to become reality? Um, and I think that uh, if I could sort of summarize how I view the challenges, it really has to do with the need to, and it says right here, uh, to expand beyond Silicon Valley. Now, what I mean by that is when we survey who current customers are of electric vehicles, it's disproportionately white, wealthy, older men who live in this geographical region or similar regions. Now, this particular demographic um, is important, right? They have the social and economic privilege to be able to be first adopters. And we wouldn't be where we are here in the state in terms of vehicle adoption if it wasn't for that demographic. Um, that being said, I think that now is our opportunity and our challenge is to transition beyond that early adopter market and really diversify the kinds of folks who are driving electric. That means focusing on age, right? We should be out there and focusing on folks in their 20s. 
um, who are poised to be uh, to, to go out and buy their first vehicle. Um, and it's interesting, too, because it makes so much sense, right? They're a generation that is showing um, their value system actually really aligns with driving electric. Um, or in many instances, and, and myself included, not having a car at all, right? So why aren't we out on college campuses? Why aren't we focusing our incentives and our education on this particular demographic? It's ripe for opportunity. Um, the other opportunity for diversification is gender. Um, I saw some really interesting research recently that suggested that uh, women are uh, pr primary decision makers in about 85% of car buying decisions. And yet, we are the minority in the car industry. Um, and this, this conference actually is a great example of being a minority. Uh, when you look at you know the folks who are presenting here, um, it's about 80-20 men to women. And so this is, again, just another really great opportunity to bring women into the fold. Um, the other area I think that we could really diversify has to do with housing stock. Almost half of Californians are renters, meaning they have and face really unique barriers to driving electric because they don't have the control always to be able to charge at home, right? Um, and so we, we are doing, particularly at this state, really focusing on how do we... Um, how do we uh, get infrastructure that's public in multifamily spaces? Um, but there is way more to do um, in this particular space. Um, and then lastly, and I think most importantly, we've got to figure out how to reach low and moderate income Californians. Because let's be real, that's the majority of California. Um, a great example of a program that's coming out that's that's aiming to do this is the California Vehicle Assistance Program. So this is something that is going to be funded through the cap and trade auction proceeds. And what they're doing is they're offering grants and fair financing to low-income Californians who want to buy a new or a used vehicle. And I emphasize used because that's another part of the transition that we have to make. Um, most people, when they go to buy a car, aren't looking for a new car, right? They're looking for a used car. And so really focusing on the secondary market and figuring out how we can make, like demystify that is critical. I actually, um, a couple days ago, went on Craigslist in Sacramento, which is where I live, to see you know what was out there in the secondary market. And I found 12 Nissan Leafs. And they were all, appeared to be super cheap for the model year that they were. Um, but, Unlike, like with internal combustion engines, right, we have like a little bit of common knowledge around what you need to look for in order to, to kind of predict whether that vehicle is a lemon or not. And in this space, I have no idea whether a 2011 Nissan Leaf that cost $6,000 and have 50,000 miles is going to be good or not, right, in terms of how the battery performs and what the recharge is. And I'm in this space, Right? So how do we demystify this for folks? I think it's a huge opportunity. So in closing, I would just say that um, for us to make this a reality, we have um, a lot of challenges that we're going to need to overcome. Um, and those really are wrapped up in transitioning away from the focus on the early adopters and really figuring out how we can leverage California's diversity um, to really expand um, the market potential. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Courtney. I, I really appreciate how you put together policy making and consumer needs, interests, and behavior because that's in the end, I guess, what it's what it's all about. Uh, after all, we are not just dealing with with numbers. We're actually dealing with people who have needs and preferences and so on, and um, might have also <coughs> certain brand affiliations, such as BMW, a company I used yeah. to work for, still have very fond memories. Therefore, it's great to have uh, Monterey Gardner here today, Senior Advanced Technologies Engineer at BMW. Uh, okay. Please share a few more insights on electrification at BMW. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sven. So I've been out of California for about 10 years. I, I was about five years in DC working for the Department of Energy, and then a few years overseas, both in uh, Japan and Germany. So just bringing an international perspective to this panel, I think this, this question here of electrification at scale, myth or reality is really dependent on how society values carbon, right? So as we march down this path of decarbonization, it's going to be renewable energy and electrification that's working together to allow us to meet those goals. So BMW has been around for 100 years. We just had our anniversary in 2015. 
Um, we have over 100,000 employees at, uh, at 130,000. And in order for us to survive, we're going to have to be part of this transition. And amongst uh, autonomous driving, digitalization, and so on, um, electrification is a core component of um, what we're going to have to transition to um, to survive. And so it's not just going to be the auto manufacturers, though. It's going to be multiple companies um, within society that are, are going to allow this to happen at scale. <clears throat> so for BMW's part, right, we've sold over 100,000 um, plug-in electric vehicles. We just had um, a big event in December of last year. Um, handing over the 100,000th, uh, wasn't just i3s, but of plug-in vehicles. Um, there's probably close to 30,000 just i3s, all electric, uh, that have been sold cumulative in California. So we're pushing this forward. And as this slide shows, looking to the future, by 2025, we're going to have a full 25 models that are electrified, and at least 12 of those will be um, all electric um, vehicles. So it's very clear that plug-in hybrids come first um, as the bulk of it, and then we'll gradually transition more and more to all-electric drive. Um, and so this electrification is going to happen in stages. Um, <clears throat> and so... Anything else on this slide? No, we can, I guess the, the one thing I would say that um, our next more exciting vehicles, looking at longer range and, and bigger changes will be after the 2020s, 2021 timeframe with our iNext, um, the, the first level three autonomous vehicle, and then sometime after that for the i4, looking at longer range electric vehicles. So we have a clear transition path in, in this um, electrification space and, and right, supporting California, supporting the world, and getting to this uh, mass adoption of uh, electrified vehicles. <clears throat> so how do we do that? So I'm sure people have heard about, right, what are the challenges, right? Why are we even asking this question? So right, there are the, the societal parts, right? Do people know about them, right? Try to explain a battery electric, a plug-in electric, and then a hybrid that doesn't plug in to somebody where, right, from a, right, a overall, perspective, energy is right the last thing that people worry about and kind of transportation, how you're getting from A to B. Um, and so in order to do that, there's a big um, importance to getting people in the vehicles. So I might ask the audience, how many people have uh, driven in an electric car? Okay, so right, it's self-selecting this panel. <laughs> Conference. Reality. Right, reality, <laughs> Woo, we've made it, <laughs> mass uh, scale. Um, <laughs> And so UC Davis, we've been working with them closely. Ken Karani has shown that um, even from 2014 to 2017 and doubling the chargers, um, it hasn't changed the perspective in how much charging is needed. Um, and so I think it's really critical to these ride and drives and um, Velos and some of the other things that BMW is doing to support getting people into these vehicles. Um, we're also looking at a opportunity to get more of these I3s that come off lease um, after just three years, right, these are really radical cars, maybe not so much now, they're, right, more than four years old, um, but they're all carbon fiber body, right, they're 100% renewable energy based from Moses Lake in Washington. Um, we have a wind farm in Leipzig where we are using 700 uh I3 Second Life batteries to make sure we decarbonize on the production side. So. All of these are coming before we get to the vehicle. And um, if we can find a, a play, way to extend the life of those I3s on the road, I think there's a lot of value. And as Courtney mentioned, right, finding this way for uh, lower income and finding ways for this to come into, um, yeah, longer use will be important. So we're doing what we can um, to en encourage that. So once the cars get on the road, the question is, right, what happens when you put right, several megawatt chargers on a single distribution node. And as with the last panel, right, the, the elephant in the room that wasn't asked, right, why are the CCAs being leaned on is, right, in talking to them, they have zero incentive to in, implement, right, better use of renewables on those distribution grids, right? They just buy renewable credits. And so if you can find a way to incentivize direct connections between renewable energy, electric vehicle charging, right, then you can help adopt and get to this mass scale in a faster manner. 
And one of the ways of doing that is allowing telematics on the vehicle to communicate directly to the utility who's managing that energy flow, right? Getting to two way energy flows on the grid um, is really critical. And that's what charge forward is. Um, and it's right, allowing right, a, a dumb low cost charger to talk directly to the grid. And we're already in phase two. We've been doing this a few years with uh, PG&E. It'll be coming to an end next year. But right, show, showing that we can take an aggregated load of several hundred vehicles and having 100 kilowatts that can be bid into um, the electricity markets as a demand response. So this is not vehicle to grid, but just choosing when the vehicles charge as needed. Um, okay, we'll go to the next slide. Probably over five minutes. So uh, BMW is very uh, focused on um, bringing all this together. I talked about the, the i3 factory with the 700 um, stationary batteries uh, supporting that battery back charging or telematics, right? How are we going to support the grid? You can't get to mass scale unless the grid is uh, reliable and stable. Next. And as far as decarbonization, right? Is SB100, who knows here about SB100? A handful of people. California is trying to get to a 100% renewable energy in 2045, right? This well in advance of any other country that's looking at 80% reduction by 2050. That's going to take mass decarbonization. And the way you do that, one option is hydrogen for energy storage. And I think in the late 2020s, we're going to have to start looking at that, getting more hydrogen vehicles in the heavy duty sector, especially to allow the renewable um, integration. I think that's everything. So BMW is doing its part. Um, we are reaching towards, uh, I think, more than 140,000 electrified vehicles by the end of 2019. And we're moving forward, um, yeah, where we can. So we're happy to work with partners. And yeah, thanks. Great. One of my thanks. Thanks very much uh, for those insights, especially the ultimate driving machine. What are you doing there in order to lure people into electrification? Which obviously is some um, advocacy in itself, and I think that's a good transition to, to John Bevel. Um, looking at what Calstar is doing, also quite a spectrum actually of activities and um, directions. Okay, uh, Sven really challenged whether I'd stick to my five minutes or not, so I, I really am going to. Uh, very quickly, uh, this is our headquarters in Pasadena. We have 84 kilowatt system. We've been uh, charging, uh, powering our building for more than seven years, uh, powering about eight vehicles every day, 100% of our electricity on an annual basis covered by solar, uh, and it makes good economic sense. We are a, uh, an organization trying to promote the advanced, the clean transportation technologies industry, so it includes a wide array of fuels and technologies, but clearly electric is a big part of that. Before I go to my next slide, let me just ask you, a lot of EV drivers in the room, California gasoline demand, given all these EVs coming into the market, over the last five years, have we seen demand for gasoline in California increase? If you think it's gone increase, raise your hand. And I'll ask you if it's gone down, raise your hand. So increase, raise your hand. Okay, a little less than half. So people who think it's gone uh, down, consumption has gone down. Did, it, did I say that right? Increase, okay, good. All right, so next slide. So uh, one more click, uh, Sven. So th this is the problem. Last six years, uh, gasoline demand has been rising in California. We are nowhere along the way toward 2050 on the transportation side, hitting our greenhouse gas emission target. We're still going in the wrong direction. So despite all you good folks in the room driving EVs, me included, uh, we're, we're, we haven't turned the ship around. So right now, unfortunately, the answer to the question for the, the session is myth. That, that's a, un the unfortunate answer. So. Let's talk about why we could be optimistic. Incredible advances in energy storage. Uh, the, the, the Bolt today is uh, such a much better electric vehicle than my 2011 Nissan Leaf. Uh, I don't know if there are any Nissan people in the room, but I may not go back to Nissan based on that experience. Uh, but this is the cars out there now are much better. Next slide, please. Uh, so we've really got what I call EV 2.0, a car with incentives, 30,000 bucks. Uh, or less, and it has a range of, two, of 200 miles or more on a charge. That's the new standard. And that is a car that I think has much greater mass market appeal. Next slide, please. The other company with an EV 2.0, right here, uh, the largest employer 
uh, a clean energy employer in the state of California, Tesla. We ought to be very thankful for all those jobs that they create. Next slide. So EVs compete well when they compete. Uh, anybody know how many segments there are in the automotive, the, the car market in, in the United States, in California? How many different segments are there? About 15. Uh, 15, 20, actually, according to new car dealers in California. So uh, there are lots of different segments. And in a few segments, EVs are really killing it. Uh, the Bolt is the best-selling best subcompact. Tesla, best-selling luxury high-end sports car, much <laughs> due to uh, the detriment of their competitors. Uh, and then, but the big problem is right now, we have had a huge shift. The sedan market is in a free fall. And we have this huge shift, once again, to SUVs, crossover vehicles, pickup trucks, and very limited plug-in product. So if we're going to get to reality, we have to see the OEMs come forward with electrified vehicles in those, those market segments. That's going to be a huge part of it. Uh, and then just an example of the red is the, in that, that pre, mid-sized premium sedan market, Model 3. You can see what Tesla is doing. And as they work out their production issues, they're really going to be killing that segment. So that's the really good news is that EVs can compete really well. I'm going to stop here. I have additional comments about the importance of unlocking value uh, and why I hate seeing uh, EV adoption curves thrown up there with cell phone adoption curves. And I can talk about that later. <laughs> Did I do it? Four minutes. Yeah, how about that? Nice. <laughs> Well, thanks very much, Sean. I, I think you definitely earned the price of the most slides and the fastest talking. And uh, so I, I think great overviews here from, from our panelists. Maybe a good time to actually give them a hand because that was actually awesome. <laughs> and um, I, I, I meant to open this discussion session here with um, actually digging a little bit deeper into well, what is it now, myth or reality? But in the interest of time, and also because all of you did a great job addressing this question already with your remarks. Uh, my, my sense is right now it seems to be more a myth, even after like 10 years of electric vehicles. And, and let's, let's see how we can bring this to reality. So what, what do you think in order to reach this goal of 5 million uh, zero emission vehicles in the state of California by 2030, what actually really needs to happen and what are the barriers that we are facing on that path? Anyone? Courtney. Yeah, I'll start. I, I, met, I talked about some of the barriers. Obviously, um, we don't want availability of charging to be a barrier. Technological barrier is a big one, right? We are pinning and uh, a lot of hopes on, on the fact that battery technology improves, price comes down, there's economies of scale, um, because cost is a barrier for most people right now. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, and because I come from the Energy Commission, I would say that um, we're also mindful of the impacts of increased transportation electrification on the grid. Uh, not so much as a whole, but um, I think as folks in the previous panel mentioned, the localized impacts of those. Um, so I wouldn't say that that's a barrier per se, but certainly a, a, a potential negative impact that we want to um, to push up against. But I think it comes down it comes down to kind of a few key things: price. Um, which we're doing a lot of public policy around to try and accelerate people adopting um, and not having to wait so long for price to come down. Uh, it comes down to infrastructure, so that way people feel like they can live their lives as they normally would and that this seamlessly integrates into that, not the other way around. Uh, and then lastly, consumer awareness. Most people don't even know that it's an option. Anything to add, John or Monterey? Um, I, I, I think I think I would agree with with Courtney about the uh, certainly the importance of uh, consumer awareness. I don't think people uh, surveys have shown that the uh, the awareness about what an electric vehicle is and its benefits, despite a real increase in the number of models in the last three years in California, the the overall awareness has not really grown. So I I think a an aggressive public outreach and marketing campaign uh, is really needed. I, I think in general, uh, we need to really make sure that the incentives are there and that they're going to be there for a while to really help boost this market. Uh, I think the constant sort of uncertainty about whether we'll get it each year from the legislature is, is a bit of a problem. So I think the state needs to step up and, and make a stronger commitment that, that the incentives will be there. Uh, 
Uh, and then, then I really think we've got to continue to really work on the infrastructure uh, and get more chargers out there. If, uh, if there are any employers in the room, I think getting a workplace, uh, chargers in the workplace is incredibly important uh, because not only does it help people, particularly those who live in apartments, to have a place to charge, uh, but they become sort of a second showroom and they, they help with that consumer awareness, education. Uh, people see their colleagues come to work in EV. They start talking to them. So that's that's an incredibly part of it, uh, an important part of it. And we just we have to overall, uh, I think, start moving a lot faster than we are. I think we will start to see some more models come in in the bigger vehicles, uh, but overall the pace is not going to be sufficient uh, with the current measures in place. So um, for BMW's point of view, right, we're participating in Velos. Uh, so this is a industry group that's spending a lot of effort, um, uh, taking a lot of time to strategically, right, reach out to consumers and find out the best way, right, to spur this adoption. And I think for anybody here who's driven an electric car, right, once you're behind the steering wheel, it's very different. And then it's getting them in there. So, right, whether it's ride and drives, public outreach, right, these are the kinds of things that are needed um, to raise that awareness. And part of it is just getting people, right, to find the time and to get into the vehicle and to motivate them. And so right now we have a lot of incentives coming from California, right, for the, the federal government up to a limit, right, in the number of cars. So, right, in the coming years, those thing, those dialogues will have to continue. But, right, one of the, I don't know if it's an un unintended consequence of that level of in incentive, right? If you have $10,000, $20,000 incentives coming for these vehicles, right, what does that do to the resale market? And, right, how do you find a path to, to getting these on the road and keeping them on the road, right? This battery life, the health of the vehicle, right? How is that communicated, right, in the, in the secondary market? So, um I think there's a path forward, but as the other panelists mentioned, again, the right, the price, awareness, and then infrastructure, right? Using the infrastructure you have um, to the most, uh, giving it the most utilization possible and trying to find that business case, right? The, the various settlements and the various incentives for infrastructure aren't going to last forever, right? We want this to be a self-sustaining market, and that's finding the best way to use that infrastructure, and charge forward is one way of doing that. And right, with more communication, 5G coming, right, connecting a person's schedule uh, to the charging with real time mapping, right, all of that works together to get better utilization on the infrastructure. And I think, um, Monterey, you really made an important point. These incentives don't last forever. And uh, we obviously have quite a history in the state of California of, of yellow stickers and green stickers and white stickers. And I'm still trying to figure out what the red stickers are. Maybe can, someone can explain to me later on. But how long do these incentives need to be out there so that consumers really make a sustainable, I mean, time sustainable, long lasting decision instead of just taking advantage of like, well, this year I buy this car and I get the incentive, that's fine. Because in those numbers that I showed earlier from, from 2015, where it was dropping, there was, for instance, in, in Georgia, when in Georgia the incentives went away that the people shied away from electric vehicles. So is it like five years, 10 years, 20 years that you need to have incentives to, to really change long-term consumer behaviors and mm -hmm. beliefs, quite frankly? Yeah. I was just going to jump in with one uh, point. So in uh, Southern California, they've already, I think, disallowed um, electric vehicles in the HOV lane. And if you talk to anybody in the area, right, that's one of the biggest incentives, probably for the people in the room to own an electric vehicle. So it's already leaving uh, the incentives. So uh, Sven, maybe just to, to go off on that, that one a little bit. Um, so uh, one of the benefits of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which occurred earlier this year, uh, I, I, got, I watched a documentary, and, and uh, the, the largest single day of protests in the United States occurred on the first Earth Day, according to the records, that 20 million people got up and, and demonstrated around the world, around the country. Um, you, you, on this whole issue of climate change, there are, when do you hear about protests on campuses these days? Uh, when, is there, when are people really kind of taking the street? Uh, the governor calls this as the existential threat of our times. Uh, you know, we had the in the 1970s, you know, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio for like the 18th time caught on fire because it was just a dumping ground for industrial waste. 
you could see the air, the smog in L.A. and Pittsburgh. Uh, you had President Nixon, a Republican, sign the Clean Air Act, sign the Clean Water Act, sign the EPA, create the EPA. Um, and then you had Governor Reagan creating California Air Resources Board. But those pollutants, and, and we said what we said was you can't dump into the commons. You can't dump into the rivers. You can't just dump into our air sheds. That's no longer good. We can't allow that. So now we're in this situation where you got this invisible gas, CO2, going into the atmosphere. But we're treating it the same way we treated those rivers and the air sheds. It's a dumping ground. And, no, and people can do it without any penalty. So I think that we need, you know, and unfortunately, it's like, do we need a whole change in, in public attitude, education? I don't think the politicians at the federal level are going to drive this thing. I think the people have to drive it. So I'm just throwing that out there as a question. Is that, is that what's really needed? Is a citizens-based movement similar to what we saw on Earth Day, 1978, 68? And any thoughts how we can get there? I mean, I observed, let's say, in, in 2007, 2008, when many things came together, which was um, really climate uh, incidents such as in 2005, Hurricane Katrina and Rita, and then also in 2007, oil prices going up, and then people really flocked to buy um, um, hybrid vehicles. Is, is it really more these almost external factors, much more than like here's $7,500 and, and good luck with your electric car? Is it that we need this perfect storm to really get mass consumer adoption? I, I think that, right, incentives are, right, not looking at the system as, as a whole, and, right, it's, right, society's value of carbon, if I come back to that, right, so if we decide, right, what it costs to drive a vehicle, or what it, right, if we have toll roads, if we look at, right, what already the Bay Area is looking at, right, what's the cost of um, sea level rise, right, what's the impact on those communities if we look at some of the lawsuits that are in, right, in the, the media um, and so we're moving down that path and, and how fast it goes is going to be directly in response to right how citizens and society perceive that, that damage. So whether it's the, the wildfires, the flooding, right, all of this has an enormous impact and it's just, right, the time delay between people react and what damage is coming is going to kind of answer that question and how fast. Okay. Yep. Courtney. So my background actually is in public health. Um, I focused on uh, public health and got my degree at Berkeley, um, specifically focused on the health impacts of climate change. And the reason why is because I didn't feel like people were ever going to respond to climate change unless it actually impacted them, right? And so that's the problem here with with greenhouse gas emissions. It's this ethereal thing that happens globally and it's not, um, and, and the, the decadal process is hard to, to really factor into your decision making. So while I continue to hope and, 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 um, advocate for folks to make actions based on, um, a value system that cares about the environment and its intrinsic value and can make those long-term decisions, Science says that human behavior doesn't make decisions that way. We are short-termed in how we make our decisions. And so things like state incentives to bring down the upfront cost of a vehicle are effective in changing behavior. Now, the question, of course, remains how much do we need, how long do we need it, um, and that's part science, part art. Um, and I will say that the state continues to evaluate the level at which we offer incentives um, to try and continue to move that needle. Um, but it's it's not easy, and I think it's important to, to really remember that we are not like um, homo rational, right? Like we are very much um, emotion driven in our decision makings. Um, and car buying is, is not that different. I mean, there's been a lot of research that's shown that um, even when you try to educate people around that over the life of the car, uh, when you factor in how much per mile you pay for electricity versus gas, you'll be saving money. People don't care. It's not sexy, right? So we really need to start to um, focus. If we want to get at scale, we've got to start uh, recognizing how humans make decisions um, and really catering to that. 
I think the homo rational, it's a, it's a very important point. Um, before we go to questions from the audience as well, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the supply side. So I think it's very important to note the demand side, our consumers getting behind it, our consumers interested in these vehicles. But on the supply side, and we heard already a little bit about uh, the infrastructure and the utilities, and, and I'd like to discuss a little bit more what needs to happen maybe also, on especially bringing different players together, so vehicle manufacturers, uh, utilities, other service providers, maybe retail businesses to actually install uh, charging stations in this. And if, if I may maybe start with, uh, with Monterey, uh, because you gave us um, quite some interesting examples, and I know that BMW has worked together for quite some time with PG&E. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more like usually the, the automotive companies are always called the dinosaurs and the slow moving companies. What is it like to work together with quick and very nimble utilities? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, right, coming back to that previous question and transitioning, right, it's the policy. So, right, that um, right, million dollar, several million dollar grant from the CEC is what enabled this partnership to start up, right? So if we didn't have that California direction and policy, we wouldn't be where we are. But, right, BMW is an innovative company, right? And we're always looking at ways to make this work better. And so that telematics, I think there's maybe one or two other auto manufacturers going in that direction. But it's definitely a future that I think all of the auto manufacturers are moving towards Right, as we get closer with 5G coming ubiquitous in vehicles. Um, but working with PGE has been great. Um, my colleague, Adam Langton, is the project manager. He sits a few desks away. Um, but, right, he's, I think, very appreciative. And we're already talking about, right, what are the next steps that we can go to after the second phase? So, yes, they do have this uh, reputation as being slow and like dinosaurs, but. It, uh, anybody know how fast CPC works on rate changes? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, you can correct me, right? If it takes five, ten years for rate change to come through and technology with solar panels are going faster and if people may know about the duck curve, right? How can you, how can an auto manufacturer, right, uh, work with a utility if their hands are cuffed by the CPC and getting the right rate incentives, right? We heard about rational human beings and right we need that real-time pricing being up and front and center to the consumer to make those changes is that something maybe john what call start can do like pull the strings in between utilities and car companies <laughs> we, and the likes we, we 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 do a lot of work trying to bring people together and and uh, and operate programs and and there are there's a, there are a lot of opportunities uh, i will just say that i think another key driver in all this is a regulatory measure uh, that there's both the federal vehicle efficiency standards um, and, and the Trump administration is trying to push those back. Uh, if, if we can hold those or, or maybe make some minor modifications, um, I think that will continue to drive the market forward. California also has its own uh, ability to set a zero emission vehicle uh, requirement on, on the automakers. Uh, Colorado just this week decided to sign up to that program. So now there are California and I think 13 other states. Uh, so that's that's a pretty exciting development. The state's in the process of figuring out what those targets should be post-2025, starting to collect data and information. So that's another key uh, regulatory tool that the state has to help drive that change forward and bring help encourage more vehicles, more plug-in vehicles to the market. Okay, I, I just want to see a question from the audience. If you don't mind coming to this microphone here, maybe, and whoever's first, first come, first serve basis, please bring your questions. So I bought a Volkswagen e-Golf because I looked around at some of the other cars. I couldn't afford a Tesla, but I wanted something that was really nice looking. And I have to say that a lot of the cars that are on the market now are a little bit clown carny, <laughs> car e like. So getting to that sexy, and, and I know that the Tesla engineers actually had in mind making their car look great and have people want to drive it. So how can we like start to talk to manufacturers about making it a little bit more fun, not as um, goofy and kind of obviously a climate car? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Compliance car. <laughs> um, so I think it's going to take time, right? Was looking at the energy density, um, right? Making sure that that car is affordable, right? So if you look at, does anybody know what the Tesla 3 was offered at and what it's actually being sold at? Yes. It's 2X, right? So if you want to do mass market, you want to sell, 
right? Hundreds of thousands of vehicles, I misspoke earlier, but right, we're getting to 500,000 plug-in vehicles by the end of 2019. And that means transitioning from right plug-in electric, where it doesn't look a lot different, looks normal to all electric, but we need the cost to come down right to make profit that's really important for bmw maybe not other manufacturers and it's also really important right to have a car that's fun to drive and you need that technology balance and and the design can i just add to that i yeah, actually please. um obviously i don't work for a car company but um just from what i've observed i feel like it really depends on the car company um so in sacramento i went to my local audi dealer um, and uh, their, um, they were also had a, a Fiat lot as well um, and their Fiat um, was uh, I asked like is this popular the electric version and they were saying how the electric version was way more popular than than the um, internal combustion engine version but visually you couldn't tell the difference right so they had figured out uh, and, and I'd asked them they're like we're not going to manufacture a car that we don't want to put our uh, like Fiat label on so it needs to look good and in fact it was identical so I feel like that's kind of a, an interesting experiment because you have a car that looks the same it looks the same, and yet it's, at least where I live, way more popular, the electric model, than the non-electric model. So I do think there's something to be said for, uh, again, it's we're emotional, right? And cars are part of American culture, and we want to, you know, look good when we're driving. So we've got to make sure the cars can fulfill that need. Yeah, and it, it really seems to be almost the holy grail in terms of, on the one hand, make it look like a normal car. On the other hand, make it stand out like I'm one of those who believe into it. And, and I personally find observing how Toyota is designing the Prius, with the very first Prius, like yeah. the second, okay, third, getting there. And now the fourth version, I think, that we see, let me just say interesting. But uh, Tesla has done that. That's right, yeah. yeah. Next question. Yeah, so um, I went for the BMW i3 for three reasons. Uh, one was, um, of course, going in the diamond lane, also knowing that the BMW, the performance is going to be great. And they also had this mobility program, mm -hmm. which also attracted me. So if, uh, if I want to go to um, San Diego, for example, eight, um, five, six, 700 miles, uh, I can um, get a loaner car uh, mm -hmm. from BMW because I own an i3 and I could go to San Diego and come back. Mm -hmm. So, um, and by the way, just to let you know, I've loved that car. Okay, great. And I'm gonna go for another one pretty soon. Uh -huh. um, uh, very good. Uh, so that was one. The, I have a question for Courtney. Oh. Uh, DC mm -hmm. fast chargers, which are 440 volt yeah. DC, there's not too many. That's right. Uh, 220 not volts, yet. there's, so is there any uh, plan? Yeah, so, um, the answer, the short answer is yes. There's a plan. Uh, the part of the governor's goals um, includes a focus on DC fast charging. Uh, right now, we have about, about 1,800 DC fast chargers here in California. Um, we want to get it to 10,000. That's the goal. Um, and so, over the course of the next eight years, um, as I mentioned, the governor's budget um, is um, hoping to put around 812 million dollars over the course of the eight years in infrastructure alone. A big part of that is is DC fast charging, and we're really going to be doing in a very targeted way. Um, and the other thing I should mention on infrastructure investment is there's a lot of private investment, utility investment, settlement monies going this space. Um, local governments are, um, are working in this space. And so we will really be trying with the state money to look at that landscape and target our investments to fill the gaps. Right. And DC fast charging is, I would say, a great example of that to make sure that there are interstate corridors that um, not only have it, but it's sufficient. Right. You're not standing there and waiting in line um, when you're trying to, to go down to L.A. for the day or whatever. Um, so, uh, yes, it is absolutely part of the plan. Right, and thanks for sharing your motivation buying the vehicle, which really shows us it's not just one thing because it's electric. I'm buying it. There's more to that. One more comment. My my younger more son comments. says, "Hey, Dad, you got a spaceship?" <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> which makes you pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, please. Yes, um, one observation, and that is the three of you all talked at one point about the environmental costs of the carbon economy. And this seems to be the, the key that we, a key to this. And one of the things that we perhaps ought to be considering more carefully than we have for some time 
is a carbon tax, a revenue neutral carbon tax. That would change the relative prices of electric vehicles versus internal combustion vehicles. And as any economist can tell you, changes in relative prices have a big impact on demand. So I, I want to get that point out there, is that if we could, there have been a lot of studies on monetizing the costs of, of, of carbon pollution. And if we can make the case for revenue neutral, that is, we, we take the carbon tax and then we offset the revenues of that carbon tax by reductions of other taxes, say the California state income tax, federal income tax, um, maybe we can make a maybe we can make a case. The other thing is that you haven't really addressed, except tangentially, the the real elephant in the room as far as the demand for electric cars, and that is, although, although Courtney did partly when she said that the government, the uh, state government is emphasizing fast charging, but right now with my Ford Fusion Hybrid, I can drive down to LA and back to Bakersfield on one tank of gas, mm -hmm. fill up the tank in 10 minutes, and come on home. Now, what kind of electric vehicle and when will even begin to approach that? And, and by the way, that's a nice, comfortable sedan. It's not a... <laughs> A t so, tiny little... Uh, any, anything that little. we see in the future that can beat that from Bakersfield yeah. to San Or Diego even, even begin to approach it. I mean, you've yeah. got a 240-mile well, range. Well, yeah. let's So that means, <laughs> that means I can get a little more than halfway to L.A. Yeah. before I have to stop at a charging station. Right. So let, let's see. Let, let's hear so, our experts. Thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks very much. And also, carbon tax, yeah. political suicide. <laughs> Question mark. No, I don't. That's a different panel. <laughs> right, right. Um, but maybe I, I will just comment on yes. your on your first point. Um, obviously, the state doesn't have a carbon tax. We have a cap and trade program, which is a market mechanism. Uh, last year, the year before, it's all blending. Um, the transportation fuels were brought under the cap. As a result of that, we estimate that um, it's roughly translated into a nine cent increase per gallon uh, in terms of and but. Gasoline tax in general, it, right now, right in California, is a very contentious issue. There are a lot of people here in the state, um, particularly low-income people, who that really impacts. So f figuring out sort of the balance and the trade-offs in terms of how do you change behavior, um, but also don't penalize um, uh, folks, and, and there's an equitable perspective. That's a tough one, um, but I will I will just say that the state does have um, we we do have a program that tries to uh, put a price on carbon. So. All right, John, you one way. Uh, yeah, sure. Well. Go ahead. Okay, so just on that question, right? When are those cars coming? Right, and and it's directly proportional to cost and right how far you can get. So right, electric cars can get about half that distance, and more is possible. But um, right, it's going to take more technology advances. But for BMW, right, it's the, the plug-ins, hybrids, plug-ins, and then electrics. And then when consumers ask us, when, right, when people are ready for that range, then hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, I think, are that long distance mm -hmm. uh, option. John, would you agree? So um, I, I think we, we should be thinking about when the, we get the politics to change nationally about a, a carbon tax. And it, I like the revenue neutral. I think it needs to be done in conjunction with all the other policies we're pursuing, particularly because the carbon tax doesn't filter down to a price per gallon uh, that's really that meaningful. It, it can impact a lot of the other sectors more quickly than it will transportation. I just want to call out that this governor exercised some incredible political leadership this year and got the gasoline and the, or last year, got the gasoline diesel taxes increased adjusted for inflation. They haven't changed in price uh, amount since 1993. He was able to pull that off, get two-thirds vote. Uh, the oil industry, uh, hopefully not Shell participating, uh, is uh, uh, going to, as a measure on the ballot in, in November, uh, to overturn those that gas tax. Uh, so I hope everybody's aware of that uh, and, and will go turn out and reject that, that proposition. All right, a little bit of political... 
uh, statement here as well, but why not? It's an open forum. Please, uh, four more and crisp questions, uh, maybe. Steve Kadivar. One answer to this question is probably Al Gore saying, inconvenient truth. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah, so therefore, those who really want to have all the time convenient must face inconvenient mm -hmm. truth, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my question is that federal government or state government sometimes really go into the uh, trouble of helping um, people to buy their houses by funding or mm -hmm. contributing into the uh, um, first payment and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we started the discussion saying that we have to go beyond Silicon Valley. So what is, you know, the bold movement from the government entity um, come by and saying that, you know, those mm -hmm. who cannot yeah. afford buying, let's help them. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, thanks so much. I mean, it's, it's great if a Tesla buyer gets yeah. uh, $7,500 tax breaks, but what about the second-hand market for a LEAF that's a 2011? Um, sounds like a good deal, but do we know if it is? So yeah. what, what can be done I'll, in order to... Yeah, I'll to comment help. on that. Um, so we're actually trying to explore a whole variety of innovative ways um, to get low and moderate income folks in these vehicles. At the beginning, I, I mentioned one of them, the California Vehicle Assistance Program. Um, this is offering, in addition to uh, CVRP, grants and fair financing for folks to be able, who qualify as low income, to be able to buy both a new or a used EV. So it doesn't have to be a new one. Um, and I think that's really critical. But there's other ways to, to allow that um, population base to really benefit from this. Um, we're investing in um, electric vehicle, car, and ride sharing, particularly in disadvantaged and low income communities. We're also piloting uh, electric van pooling, uh, not only in urban spaces, but also in the agricultural agricultural space because a lot of folks um, who are the migrant farm worker population, they um, really benefit from having that that to, uh, to get from one place to another. Um, but there is more to do in this space for sure. Uh, and that's one of the areas that we continue to evaluate. Oh, I should mention too that with CVRP, we offer more money for folks who make less money um, to try and help bridge that gap, which um, at this stage is necessary, but uh, not sufficient. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a bit happening. Would it be fair to say it's also trying out things and see what sticks and then obviously you need to revise, I guess? Yeah, this yep. is uh, mm -hmm. partly an uh, experiment, right? Yep. Um, figuring out how you change people's behavior is, uh, is no easy task. Great, thanks. We have three more quick questions. Uh, yeah, this question is for Monterey. It's relating to BMW uh, safety issue. I am an owner of BMW 3 Series and mm. I enjoyed the driving. Except about a month ago, while I was driving on Montego Expressway right at rush hour, my car stopped while mm. I was driving without oh. any warning. Oh. And actually, it's still in the dealership today. Mm. And I've tried to get some data to understand what, what has happened and... Um, uh, not so helpful from the Mountain View dealer. I wonder if you can help me to get some. <laughs> <laughs> there I, might be an offline conversation. We don't mind. We have two, two more questions. Yeah, yeah, I'll do whatever be, I can. Uh, the but other after question the panel, is, we when we shift to electrical vehicle, then the engine stalling issue, does it improve relative to the conventional gas, gas um, engine? is because I need some data to boost my confidence in BMW. I need to make a decision on what is my next step. Mm -hmm. Am I going to keep this uh, 60,000 mile vehicle or I need to change to a different one? Mm -hmm. Then what kind? I like to go for a more uh, environmental correct one, but safety is the most concern to end co consumer. Mm -hmm. And I happen to be um, unlikely enough to experience the experience, but lucky yep. enough, there was no injury or accident. Uh, okay, so, since we made <laughs> uh, voting recommendations, let's make purchase recommendations. <laughs> yes. Do you want to comment briefly uh, on it? We, we are running so, out of time. Yeah, right now, I, I think we can talk offline about that, but I, I think um, for the, the auto start stop, I didn't quite understand the question, but I mean, that will reduce wear on the engine and it's important on the emission side, but we can talk more about 
yeah, the vehicle and the challenges you've had. Luckily, I'm a Volt driver, so I won't be bothering you with that. <laughs> uh, so I think one of the sort of the elephants in the room that we haven't talked about about electrification at scale is China. And I'm really yeah. curious, especially when you think about, I think, Monterey, this is particularly for you, mm -hmm. when you think about the supply chain and the fact that you're building up the whole EV supply chain today, right. and a large part of that is catering to the Chinese market, mm -hmm. how does that sort of interfere with your plans, or does it complement, perhaps, your plans for California? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, so I think that question of scale and manufacturing supply chain is critical, and right China wouldn't is somewhat following the ZEV mandate, right? As you look at the ZEV mandate moving there and then to Europe, right? You need those bankable policies for the auto manufacturers to to come into this uh, right new transition of electrification. So, yeah, I agree that right it is helpful in reaching that. Last question before my closing question. Last question. Yeah. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Um, I missed the first part of this, so forgive me if this was a question that was already discussed at length, but for the last few years, I've really been looking at the intersection of electric and shared vehicles and mm -hmm. believe that there's a huge potential for vehicle sharing to kind of overcome some of these problems that were um, voiced earlier. I'm thinking particularly, uh, Courtney, your mm -hmm. comment about uh, human irrationality, and I think that's 100% agreement when it comes to a personal purchasing decision, but when you're looking at a, a fleet uh, purchasing decision, the economics really work in favor of heavily utilized electric vehicles. And I just want to know if, if anybody, you or the others, had, mm -hmm. had comments about that. So uh, your academic colleagues at UC Davis are pushing the three revolutions, the, the shared, automated, and and um, electric. Uh, professor, I think you're talking about a two revolution, uh, the shared and, and electric. Yes. Uh, and I, I do think in the nearer term, we hopefully we'll see a lot of that. Uh, there's a bill in the California legislature right now trying to mandate that the TNCs move in that direction. It's a little tricky since the, the transportation network companies, Uber and Lyft, don't own their vehicles. Exactly. So how do we do that? How do we create incentives? Uh, we are really interested in working with the Energy Commission and targeting some of the infrastructure dollars so that there can be those clusters of the DC fast chargers in areas where the, the TNCs tend to operate. They're high mileage drivers. So providing that incentive so that they could have kind of like a gasoline station type experience and we could see more. So because, I mean, if we can get more EVs in the hands of the, these high mileage TNC drivers, I mean, that would be fantastic. So we really, we ought to be trying to make that happen. Anything like reach now, maybe? Yeah, reach now. I, I think at the end of the day, there has to be a sustainable business case. And I think if you look at cost per mile in areas like San Diego and parts of PG&E, depending on what rate you have, you're paying more for that electric vehicle, right? Oftentimes, we talk about wholesale electricity prices, not retail. So you're paying more per mile. So you're forcing these companies to lose money. And that's the second item is utilization, right? How many miles can you go on a single charge? And can you get the same use out of that vehicle if you're working back to back? The really good news is we, we now have options. When you have cars with 240 mile range, uh, you know, now we can really have that discussion. We couldn't have it with the early Nissan Leaf. So that, that's the exciting thing. And, and I think, you know, trajectory is downward in price, terms of price of batteries, which is really good. And there are some great companies that are in stealth mode here in the Bay Area that company that have been invested in. And that could be a real step. Uh, function change in terms of battery performance. Courtney. I was just going to add, a, we kind of had agreed as panelists before this to keep um, the medium heavy duty space off the table because um, we could talk about that all day too. But I think in terms of automation, I mean, uh, we, we we think about, you know, the, the extreme, which is the self-driving cars, but of course there's all these iterations in between. And I think the medium heavy duty space is one of those areas where, you know, trying to electrify, but also having intelligent transportation systems is a huge opportunity opportunity. Um, but maybe we can talk about that next year. We might do this. Maybe as a closing question, uh, just, just really quickly, because I, I want to give everybody of you the opportunity to close this discussion, maybe with a recommendation what the rest of the nation can learn from California, because we've been talking about California quite a bit, and we saw in some of the numbers earlier that the U.S. at scale is at a different point in this uh, moment. So what can we really recommend from here, from California, to the rest of the nation? Maybe a quick closing statement. Uh, I, would, I would say uh, the, the political courage to set in place the right uh, regulations and find the revenue to provide the incentives and get the charging out there. 
Thanks. Yeah. I, I think it's really important to have stability, right? So if you look at how long the ZEV mandate has been pushing to get where it is, right? We need, industry needs bankable policy that's gone through courts before they can make that decision. And so we need something that's long-term and not going to be yo-yoed back and forth from mm -hmm. the federal government. Courtney. Um, this is a tough one because they just took both of mine. Uh, but I, I would just add to that that um, I think something that other states can learn from California is um, that and we're an advantage, right, because we're one of the largest economies in the world. Um, but that being said, I think there's something to be said for being able to act locally. Um, and California shows time and again, whether you're talking about renewable energy or energy storage or electric vehicles, that we can do this even in the absence of federal um, uh, uh, support. Um, certainly our governor has been a leader. Um, I'm hopeful that our next governor will um, continue to carry that baton. Um, but uh, the world is watching. So, yeah. Great. Thanks very much, Courtney, Monterey, and John. And I think we will be around for a few more questions.